Okay, good morning everyone and can I welcome everyone to the 21st meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided uh, to MSPs in a digital format, tablets may be used by some members during the course of the meeting. We've got a, a full house today, delighted to see, no apologies have been received and we move to agenda item one, pre-budget scrutiny 2019-20. Workforce planning. Now, we're feeling we're way a little bit in relation to budget scrutiny because this is the first year the community has undertaken a new approach to budget scrutiny as recommended by the Finance and Constitution Committee following a review carried out by the Budget Process Review Group. This involves parliamentary committees carrying out pre budget scrutiny throughout the course of the year, so it's an all year round business budget scrutiny. Uh, today, the committee will take evidence on workforce planning to inform its pre budget scrutiny. And this has been a recurring theme for the committee uh, in the past year or so. So therefore, can I welcome our witnesses, uh, Dave Watson, Head of Policy and Public Affairs Units in Scotland, Rebe Rebecca Marek, Parliamentary and Policy Officer, Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, Sharon Dick, President, Society for Personal and Development, Personnel and Development Scotland, I do apologise, uh, and Sarah Tennant, Talent and Organisational Development Manager, North Lanarkshire Council, representing the public sector network. Um, good morning, thank you everyone for, for, for coming along. Now, you've not been given advance warning of this, don't worry, it's not opening statements we're looking for, but, but the, the MSPs, and I've looked at this with colleagues, we're not as familiar with some of the organisations as we are with others, so I, I'm just wondering, even just a 30 seconds, just explaining uh, who your organisation are. Now, Dave, we, we know who Unison are, but We'll give you your 30 seconds anyway in the interest of equality. <laughs> so why don't we start with yourself, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm Dave Watson, I head of policy at Unity Scotland. We are Scotland's largest trade union. Uh, we're also the largest trade union in, in local government. We represent 155,000 workers, uh, mostly in the public sector, but some in the private sector across, certainly in local government, across every profession and, uh, and sector. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm from the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. Um, we're a strategic anti-racism organization. We do a lot of work with policy and the public sector equality duties. We work with different public bodies and with um, the Scottish government and the parliament to advance race equality. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sharon Dick from the Society of Personnel Development Scotland. Um, our association society is representation represents sorry most of the local authorities. Um, we've got 30 of the 32 councils, so really we try to look at best practice from a um, policy and personnel and our workforce um, perspective, covering the whole range of issues, and we work closely with COSLA to see how we can influence. Thank you. Hi, Sarah Tennant. So I'm representing the Public Sector Network today. So we are a member of the Public Sector Network um, within um, North Lanarkshire Council. Um, the network was set up in 2015 from Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Government. And we've got representation, I think, from just over 63 uh, public bodies. Um, and it is growing. And there's representation there, obviously, from local authorities as well. Um, the purpose of the group really is to look at how we can improve um, young workforce development. Um, and we address and identify, I guess, a common areas and challenges that we have. And the benefit of that network is that we can collaborate, we can learn from each other, we can share practice and work more efficiently to try and address some of these challenges. Really helpful, and I sh should have pre-warned you we were going to do that. I could just let like you introduce yourselves as you have done anyway, but just I was thinking that that would be a helpful thing to do, not just for MSPs, but for anyone following this, this at home. So we'll go straight to questions now. Uh, Graham Simpson, MSP. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, convener. Um, uh, good morning. Um, in Unison's uh, evidence, uh, and the question is for all of you, but Un Unison say that since 2009, 29,000 jobs have been lost um, in local government in Scotland. Um, they say that that uh, has led to uh, an increase in workload, an increase in stress, but uh, that councils are not, uh, to a large degree, uh, doing much workforce planning. In fact, they say that only three councils uh, have produced good guides on this. I'm not sure what's happening with the other 29. Um, so I just wonder if you can sort of comment on the, the, so the, the numbers, uh, the stresses, um, and uh, the, the sort of lack or perceived lack of planning for this. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it would be uh, fair to say, I mean, the numbers are not in dispute. They're all in Scotland as well as ours and Coslers and everybody. And, and I think the important statistic is that nine out of ten austerity job cuts have been the local government. So the local government has taken the brunt of the of the job cuts there. I mean, I think yeah, the numbers speak for themselves. There's been no real reduction in the amount of work to be done, and I think that's the key point. Um, if you look at, um, and we've done, as I've, as I've outlined in the evidence, but you can look at our website and, and read some 20-odd now, um, damage surveys where we've asked the frontline staff what the impact of that is and as I've said in our evidence there are you know, a number of themes that come through that uh, most some of them could be put in the sort of phrase keeping the plate spinning uh, so essentially what people are doing is that you know they're trying to sort that problem out and then the problem just grows somewhere else so they move on to somewhere else we haven't really looked in local government there's been a lot of salami slicing of services trying to make do trying to patch and mend and, and I think that's, that obviously has real pressure on, on staff. On, on workforce planning, I think the, the, the problem is probably that councils and to extent ourselves have been very focused on managing that decline in local government, trying to manage the, the workforce consequences of austerity uh, and therefore probably not given the amount of attention that workforce planning looking forward uh, needs. Uh, there's another, I think, more cultural issue here is that local government tends to work at, at, at as you'd expect, at the local level. There isn't a great deal of coordination. Um, if you look at the health service, for example, which is a much more monolithic organised job, they do at least have a professional workforce planning, albeit only limited to a few professions. Local government doesn't tend to have that approach. So there are uh, good examples. In fairness, local government, there are more than three. Uh, there were three examples I was picking out um, that you know, there certainly are. Most councils will have some form of workforce planning. Um, but as Audit Scotland pointed out, well, they said only half had. Um, so uh, I, I'm not, I haven't done a survey precisely to, 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 to look at that. I'll, I'll accept their numbers. But what you do find is a, a fair variety. There's some very basic workforce planning. It tends to be local and ad hoc. And I think the, the, the essence of our submission is that we can do better than that. And we need to pull of that and coordinate some of that together. I should point out, I, thank you, Sharon Dick. That's very helpful. I'm very unobservant, so, so do signpost when you want anything. Sharon Dick, followed by Rebecca Marek. Um, I guess I could just follow up and talk about the councils overall as well. I would agree with um, Dave's point about the numbers. So there has been significant reduction in the numbers quoted are. We're all in agreement with them. Uh, workforce planning, I think I may be a bit more positive about it. I think um, for local authorities, there has been a lot of workforce reporting. And over the years, we have tried to move more to workforce planning and make that longer term. I think there is recognition that some of it has been quite short term and really we are making the push to make that much longer term and look, um, I guess, working with our partners, uh, local partnerships. A lot of the council have got community, will have got community plans and we look to work with our partnerships a lot more. The problem we have is there's a lot of um, conflicting priorities and it is quite hard to get the overall picture. And I think that's maybe something that the Scottish Government could help. Um, so that would be an area for us to look at. Um, there is difficulty with the resources impact, so there's a lot of challenges, breadth of issues that we're trying to address. Um, not many councils do have systems that they can use for workforce planning. Um, I think some councils have got very good examples of workforce plans. Um, they are all getting audited with Audit Scotland, so I would say that they're, they're all there to some level, um, and they are looking across the, the board at good practice, so we are trying to share that and help the councils that aren't as advanced to move forward. Um, with regard to stresses, absence continues to be a big issue for councils, um, and stress does continue to be our number one reason for absence. And we are seeing increases in the um, number of absences due to stress and in particular work-related stress. Um, I would say that is increasing in um, the majority of councils um, across the board as well. Okay, thank you. Rebecca? CRER doesn't do much work with workforce planning, um, but I think one issue I would like to highlight is if you're seeing, you know, a number in local authority staff reducing and while we're also seeing a rise in the BME population, um, it's worth kind of wondering how we're going to eventually achieve parity in terms of the BME population locally and how it's represented in councils. I think it speaks to some concerted work needing to be done to reach that. And I think it's also worth questioning, and I don't have the answer for this, but it would be interesting to know um, when jobs were reduced, whether an equality impact assessment was taken to understand whether 
there would be a disparate effect on BME um, employees losing their jobs if that would you know further reduce um, their representation on local councils. So I think when we're speaking about these issues, it's also important to keep the equality implications in mind. Thank you. Sarah, do you want to add anything? I think really just to, to back up both um, Sharon's point as well about um, there are pockets of good practice I think within certainly in, within my council that we acknowledge um, and what we want to do is build on that and take a much more consistent approach. I think your point about um, working with the support partners you know it, it's, it can be quite challenging to navigate the landscape um, so you know the, particularly the public sector network is a good example of how we can collaborate to work together to address some of these things. Okay, can I want to follow up on something else? Yeah, um, just look at this in a, a little, little more detail. Um, I think one of the, the big issues, um, probably across the public sector, but certainly in councils, is, is that we have a, an, a, an ageing workforce. Um, uh, in fact, um, I think the average, the average age of the public sector worker is, in Scotland is 45. And 40% 40 uh, of public sector staff are due to retire in 10 years. So that strikes me as we might have a bit of a ticking time bomb here. Um, and so it's, it's really important that councils do plan for that and have strategies in place. But it sounds to me like they certainly don't all, all have that. Um, the other point I think I would make is uh, quite a lot of the work that in councils is, is physical. Um, if you think about sort of roads departments, things like that. So if you've got an ageing workforce and physical work, that makes it even more difficult. So planning ahead is really important. So, so I'd, I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, what can be done? Why isn't stuff being done? Because it really, you know, we've, we've known about this for a long time. I, th I think they're very fair points. Um, you, you, there's, a, there's, there's a neat little infographic which, which I, on, in our evidence that I hope uh, helps to illustrate the point. I did some quite, quite detailed research on this last year, which is where the infographic uh, comes from. And uh, to an extent, I suppose I wasn't surprised with the numbers in local government. If you, one of the ways that we manage uh, reductions in the workforce is you have a recruitment freeze. So it, self-evidently, those who are there get older. You're not bringing in younger workers, so therefore the workforce uh, get, get, gets older. Um, I think there's been some work uh, done on the fact that there are increasing numbers of people working past 65 now as well. Um, you know, pension uh, payouts in local government are very low, so you tend to find people want to work on past 65 increasingly, particularly women uh, who obviously make up the bulk of the workforce who don't have uh, that sort of pension service in place. But the numbers still are very small. They've doubled, but it's gone from 1% to 2%. The real increase in numbers is a 50 to 60 group um, who, you know, who, who, uh, who are in work. They are becoming the big numbers. And as you say, um, you know, by our calculation, that means about 40% who are going to retire in the next 10 years. Uh, I think that creates additional issues. Um, we weren't great fans of the Criddle and Review on the state pension age, but one of the very sensible recommendations in that report, I thought, was the idea of a mid-life or a mid-work life MOT, when you actually looked at where you were and where you're actually going to be able to do these jobs. Um, I mean, there are some jobs, I remember, I don't know what the current stat is, but a few years ago, I think there was a statistic that virtually no ambulance workers have ever reached normal retirement age. Now, I suspect if we looked at one or two local government ones in, in some of the physically demanding jobs, then I suspect we wouldn't be far off that in there as well. So I do think we need to have some thought. Frankly, virtually nobody is doing any work on you know, the fact that I get invited to speak at conferences on the ageing workforce is because if you Google it, it's basically you get me and not much else. Um, so uh, it's not because we've done anything absolutely fantastic. It was a fairly simple piece of research. Um, but, the, but the reality is that, um, that we did suggest in some of that, some of the practical measures, particularly the health and safety, particularly and remember, there is still age discrimination as well against older workers in the workforce as well. The one local 
government point I'd probably finally flag up to you is that one of the challenges the local government has is that we tend, like everyone does, to focus on the big groups like social work and like education. The, I, I'd really ask you to not forget the local government has lots of small groups, small professional groups. And the problem about having local and rather ad hoc workforce planning is that you might be able to do some credible work on social care in a local community and because it's largely a local workforce. But if you're looking at trading standards or environmental health or planners, you know, you're talking about relatively small numbers for which, frankly, local workforce planning has grave limitations. And they're the sort of groups that we need to have a bit more coordination on a Scotland-wide basis for. Okay. Rebecca. And apologies in advance. I feel like I have one note to play here. But I think it's important to look at the race equality implications of an aging workforce as well, because I think that shows a good opportunity for increasing the representation of minority ethnic groups in local government. Um, all minority ethnic groups are younger than um, white UK groups with the uh, latest census figures compared 29% of white Scottish individuals are aged between 16 and 39 compared to 50% of groups from within Asian, African, or other ethnic backgrounds. So the BME community in Scotland is younger. A lot of um, those communities are sort of aging into a time when they could take up these jobs that are going to be you know, vacated through retirements. Um, so I think it's a good opportunity to look for. And to also keep in mind that a lot of um, BME people in Scotland that have been educated throughout the Scottish school system, they go to further in higher education and higher percentages. They outperform white Scottish counterparts in um, schools. So it's a great opportunity to, if we're willing to, you know, plan and take advantage of that. Okay, thank you. Any additional comments on that? I think I'd like just to second uh, Dave's point about, you know, I think we do have a great focus on modern apprenticeships and we acknowledge the, the early years expansion. But there are pockets regionally um, across local authorities who do struggle to, for particularly for construction workers, for um, planners, for surveyors, um, for occupational therapists um, and residential childcare workers. So we do need to kind of look at those areas as well and how we um, fill those pipelines. Okay. To follow up with the comment is to kind of echo some of that point, but there's, there's some of our activities like trading standards and um, roads where we're struggling to actually get the places where we can educate people. A lot of councils are looking to do modern apprenticeship programmes, but we shouldn't forget that the apprenticeship levy has an impact in, impact in councils that has reduced the number of modern apprentices overall. We're only getting 10k in um, return for the, the amount that um, local authorities are paying for that, and there is an impact. So we need to look at how we, we make sure that we continue to um, keep modern apprentices in the workforce uh, as part of it, because there are they can be an easy target for budget cuts, and that's not what we want. We want to increase our, our young workforce. We also want to see how we can work with schools better to tr make um, local authorities and a more attractive place to come for your career. Um, there is an impact as well with the pay restraint on professional um, occupations and we need to look at that as well. How can we make it attractive for people to come in for a career in local government? Okay, thank you. Graham? Um, I see Mr Stewart won't say in, so. He certainly does. Are you yeah. finished with your yes, question? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Alexander Stewart. <laughs> thank you. Can I, to, to follow on from that, some councils have now started, you're all competing with one another to try and get that workforce. Uh, can I get some views on this idea of the golden hello that some councils have chosen to go down the road of to try and entice individuals to join their council? What are your views on that? I, I mean, obviously, uh, a council wants to give our members money. Is, is, it would be strange if me as a trade union official would say no. Um, but I, I do have to say it's really not the, the way ahead. You know, robbing Peter to pay Paul is, is, doesn't seem to me to be a, a practical practical approach. We do have to recognise there are some cyclical issues uh, in local government. Now, for example, some local government professions are almost entirely in local government. Others uh, have private sector equivalents. So that if you're in areas like building control and planning, architects, engineers, to the extent the legal profession, my own profession, other, those sort of areas, we tend to find is, let's say, the construction industry is in a boom. 
they, the private sector poaches all the local government people because they pay better. Uh, uh, when that's in decline and there are jobs there, they come into local government uh, uh, in, the, in the other way. So there is a cyclical change. We're seeing it particularly, I, th yeah, I, think, I think I did provide you, for example, our report on building control, for example, which was a very good example at post Grenfell. Suddenly we've got 65 vacancies for building control officers across Scotland. Yeah, and it, in fairness, to workforce planning is difficult because obviously if we could guess the economic cycle, we probably wouldn't be working in local government. Uh, we're making a lot of money in the city. So uh, there, are, there, are, there are challenges in terms of reflecting, reflecting that. But I, I, I suppose I would say uh, it, it's a short-term measure and not a very helpful one if we look at the pi picture holistically. So I wouldn't encourage it. I prefer to see us try and do our best in terms of uh, taking a more Scotland-wide view of workforce planning right across the public sector because some jobs cut across different parts. That's a better approach than, than patching men's with uh, golden hellos or other incentives. Any other comments on golden hellos? No other comments. Alexander? Thank you, Daniel. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do it to my other question yeah. later. Okay. Can I just check a couple of things? Um, so, don't want to get into a, a, a discussion about, about headcount and the amount of staff in local authorities. Clearly, finances are challenging, headcount is challenging, but I just wanted to check that those numbers uh, about the uh, reduction, do they include... Uh, Alio workers, is that taken into account? So it's adjusted for that? Uh, actually, th there is a certain irony here that uh, our figures are the lowest of all the estimates um, because I do take account of Alios and transfers in there. It's very difficult. The numbers are not exact, and in the moment you see any numbers which are rounded to thousands, you know that these are not exact. And we do have a problem. One of the difficulties is that you have to make some estimates about the number of staff who have gone into Alios. You have to make some estimates about the numbers who have transferred. Um, I, you know, I noticed you're covering paper talked about staff going to health and social care partners. Staff don't actually go to health and social care partners. What happens is sometimes people change between local government and health, obviously most notably in Highland where there was a particular model chosen. So the difficulty is we don't know precisely who's gone where. Uh, obviously we've had less outsourcing in Scotland, so therefore the, those num that drift out there. So uh, I have to say, in fairness to Codsler, uh, their numbers were always higher than mine uh, they've come down to, to to our numbers so I take I think a fairly conservative view about about where the numbers have gone but they are estimates and there's no there's no getting around that because there just isn't the data out there which of course is one of the points we keep making um, data on workforce in Scotland not just in local government everywhere is pretty poor I think that's an important point and I'm glad that they're adjusted I, f I find that very helpful because you can, when we do come on at some point to look at the revenue budget there's numbers, more numbers, and even more numbers, uh, all looking at different angles. Does it take account of, um, I just got a note from, from my office before I come in saying that the, there was changes in police and fire service classifications in April 2013. Does it take account that, of those? That's well? all taken into account in right. those numbers. Right. Uh, that's the first number. We actually, we do know the numbers that went in that one. So that's actually the easiest adjustment to make here. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, so can I move on to, uh, I suppose, my substantive question. Now, local authorities are, are funded mainly through the revenue grant from Scottish Government. We know there's money transferred from integrated joint boards. We know there's the council tax. We know there's fees and charges. I wouldn't list all the various monies there is, but this committee will be scrutinising all of that, but there's always a significant focus on that revenue grant transfer every single year. Um, and I'm no doubt it'll be a political debate at that point about whether that number's sufficient, is it a good deal, is it a bad deal, is it indifferent? Let's actually forget what that number shows. Irrespective of what that financial transfer is to local government, should there be conditions placed on that in relation to workforce and workforce planning? Should it uh, be more closely aligned to the Scottish government's national pay policy framework, which doesn't include local government, but I think the Cabinet Secretary said it should be used as a benchmark for local government. So what's the connectivity um, in relation to that settlement and any conditionality around how that should be used to promote good workforce planning? Because this is a budget scrutiny session after all. Uh, Sharon Dick. 
Um, I, I think I'm fine with there being conditions applied to it. I think it's good practice if you, you know, so for the scrutiny aspect of it. I think if we're going to apply conditions, though, we need to work with local authorities about what they are and listen to the feedback. Because there's been issues with some of the conditions previously been placed on some councils, and, and it makes it difficult. It oh, and I don't think it yeah. helps workforce planning in the long term. No. I should say I have no idea whether there should be or not, but uh -huh. if we're talking about the, the granular... Uh, level of workforce planning, we have to know what the connectivity is between uh, local authority grant settlements and the planning that takes place on the ground. Any other suggestions on how we can follow that a bit more, Dave Watson? Yeah, I mean, I mean, when we do the, the answer to the budget, um, we always say to our people, you know, yeah, the Scottish Government grant is such a huge part of it that that's absolutely a crucial starting point. But we always say to our local people, it never looks quite the same. So you have this grand debate about, about funding at, at the Scottish Parliament level, but you're talking about that grant allocation at local level, the whole range of other uh, demands that, that are coming on. There's demographic change. Yeah, the apprenticeship levy was mentioned mentioned earlier a couple of years ago. That was the biggest increase, which you know, wasn't the taking into account anywhere that councils were having to pay that. So we always say our local people have an entirely different conversation at council level than the one you're having politically at the Scottish Parliament level. In the general approach, um, we don't favour ring fencing. We just think it's, uh, you know, this is supposed to be local government, lo local administration. Councils are not the local governors, you know, to, be, to have a hand out there. So we're not generally in favour of that what we would emphasize is that you know on pay for example the Scottish government rightly you know, sets a a public sector workforce which I accept uh, pay policy which doesn't directly impact on local government um, but clearly you know we don't want this robbing piece of the pay Paul so we don't want people jumping from local government to health because they're getting a decent pay rise and local government are not and vice versa so I do think government needs to make sure it funds its own pay policy, and clearly you will know that we, we argue very strongly, and I'm still arguing with Derek uh, Mackay about that issue to this day, uh, that it hasn't been funded. So I think the overall funding settlement should include pay policy. I'm not in favour of trying to pick out workforce groups and, and set, set uh, targets from the centre on that, because I think that needs to be a local decision. Other comments? Rebecca Marek? And I don't know how feasible this is, but I think CRER would be really interested around a conversation on um, kind of equality as it relates to these, you know, if there were to be conditions placed upon it, um, movements to achieve parity in workforce representation, um, demonstration of, you know, movements to recruit more equally, to evaluate policies more critically, to produce action plans to increase the BME representation in the workforce. Um, the Scottish government itself has committed to having parity with the population in their own workforce by 2025, and it would be great if they could encourage local authorities to do the same and um, kind of hold them to account on that. Okay. I wonder if we could ask the question a different way, because I, I, I expected to get a reaction when I used the word conditionality. Of course, of course, of course I did. Is, is there ways we can incentivize local authorities to to do more robust workforce planning. It can kind of out with the realms of possibility uh, for if there's unexpected uh, increases in cash to local authorities, if only it were so, Mr Watson, or unexpected declines in cash to, to local authorities, that there's actually a robust workforce planning uh, framework in place so you actually know what you're going to do with that money, how you tighten the belt and how you expand it and improve public services. Sometimes that will involve using reserves in a structured, planned way, rather than an emergency way, if you're upscaling or downscaling. So it, it's not our job to scrutinise local authorities. We want, we're scrutinising the budget. So is there any way that budget can be used to incentivise that good practice, which is happening in a limited fashion in local authorities, and has to happen a lot more? Sharon Dick. Um, I think I would say the single-year budget settlements make it difficult for local authorities, and I think it would be wrong to say local authorities are not keen to support robust workforce planning, because I don't think that's the case. I think they are struggling just now with the impact that they've had on the budget cuts, and they're trying to manage that best they can. They are looking to try and embrace new ways of working with digital um, and modernise. That can be quite difficult when they've not got the level to invest in maybe in some of their systems, and some councils, are, again, are more successful than others in that. It depends you know, how they've the resources that they've had, and there is difficult. I mean, Dave mentioned demographics, so it would be wrong to not look at the local picture. There is differences 
from a local perspective as well. But I think from a budget perspective, the point I was making about maybe you could have better oversight of the policy changes. We, if I use early years for the example, um, we've had, got an early years workforce where we they weren't qualified. We, we've now made strides to make them qualified. So there's an investment there, which I'm not saying is the wrong thing to do, but it costs money. And obviously you have to work with some of that workforce. It's difficult to train, but we work with them to make sure we get achieve that. Now we're having to increase to large volumes of early years. Again, not the wrong thing to do, but we're competing with ourselves. You talked about competing with other local authorities. We're actually competing with ourselves as well because it tends to be the same workforce that you would target for social care as well. So, so there's, there's policy um, changes that, when you look at them in isolation, they're maybe all the right things to do, but we have to look at that holistic picture and help to put the budgets in place to make it all happen and for us all to work joined up to deliver. Because, I mean, after all, it's all about the community. I mean, that's what, why we're here. So it's to try and achieve the best outcome for our community and residents. I'll just try to just push a little bit on, because we will look at the de in detail at the numbers one, one, once, the, once they emerge. And, and, and it, ha it happens every year, you know, the, the debate around those numbers. So I, I use the expression incentivise. What, what's other than as generous or as significant an award to local authorities as possible through the revenue grant, which I'd expecting all of you to argue for. Of course, you'd be arguing for that. That That's the single thing. We'll look at the numbers when that's published. We'll have about a week or two weeks to look at those numbers before we, give our, before we look at our report. What else and how that money is used, whether it's incentivising, so whether it's ring fence funds you can bid in for, or whether it's conditionality, so you have to spend some of it a certain way, or something as yet we haven't considered. What else can government do to assist at a local level in relation to workforce planning? Because that's kind of why we're having this evidence session. Dave I, Watson. I, I, I mean, I think probably incentivisation is further down the road for, for workforce planning. I think the starting point I'd take you earlier in the process. You know, in care, for example, we are starting, the Scottish Government has developed, uh, it started about the process for doing workforce planning and social care. We've had discussions, obviously, in early years. We've got a massive expansion of the early years sector. But, you know, huge differences of opinion. You know, but whether, is it 12,000 extra early years workers or 20,000 extra years? The, the, it, people look confused. And if you're a provider of training or a local authority, or even the private and the voluntary sector, you're saying, well, how many are we going to need? And part of the reason is that it's a difference between how many will be full-time and part-time. So I suppose my... My, uh, my, 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 my argument would be that we need to start earlier. We need to have coordinated. Don't think we're in the stage of incentivising as yet. If people ignore coordinated workforce planning, do nothing about it, then I think you bring out the stick later down the road. But at the moment, we're just not doing it. There is no proper liaison on a national basis for a whole range of areas. You know, universities start or cancel courses as and when planning it. I was called in some years ago by the Scottish Government officials who said we haven't got any planners Dave you know and I said well we've just closed one of the two planning schools in Scotland <laughs> should, should you be surprised by by that now they had no no say in that you know Queen Margaret University last week closed their masters in public administration course we've only got two of those in Scotland where are the next public service leaders going to go if universities take unilateral decisions in terms of closing courses so I, my, my plea would be for coordinated workforce planning, which involves the education providers, involves government, involves local government, to tackle, to have that. And if they don't then deliver, or the different parts don't deliver, then I have no problem about incentivising people later down, down the track. Okay, so we see workforce planning in relation to the childcare sector, because that's getting a significant expansion. Um, so obviously th there's then a debate about what what, what appropriate levels and what the skills base should be, but there's active workforce planning around that. Dave Watson's mentioning in the care sector, there's a, much more of a look and attention being given to that at, at the moment. But because of statutory duties around education, there's, there's workforce planning in relation to that and teacher training colleges and the like. There wasn't it around planning, as, as, as Mr Watson also mentioned. So is it patchy in relation to some... Is local authorities like Jigsaws, where part of the Jigsaw has a workforce planning tool, whether it's the same tool that every local authority uses, but it has a connection to the national picture and other parts of the Jigsaw doesn't? Is there a need for a holistic workforce planning tool for local authorities more generally? D does that exist? Is it in its genesis? How would we go about it? Um, 
I'll take you last on that, Mr. Watts, because I suspect that that's what you would think should happen. Um, what, what do others think? Sharon, you're on the ground trying to give advice to local authorities to do some of this stuff. I, I think with um, it's, it's down to talking about the small groups again. So the big groups have got a bigger voice. And obviously, from a Scottish government, I've probably got a bigger profile just now. So the health and social care, care integration is a big agenda item in early years. So that it is easier just now to, to probably influence. And there's more um, avenues that people can get their voice heard on what's required in these areas. Um, I mean, planning, I did see Glasgow City Council have announced a big investment because they've, they've got a, um, they're looking to create more job roles in, in that area. But... But as the point that Dave, made, as Dave has made, there is a number of university courses that stop. And sometimes local authorities might not even realise at the time. It might even be a year later. And then we realise the impact and we're starting to... Because it might not be an area we recruit in, especially like a specific local authority might not recruit in a lot. So they're then having to start looking at that and how, how do we fill these gaps of specialist um, areas. So I think, to, to go back to your question, sorry, about... a. Do we need one approach? I think there's differences in local areas. I don't know that you need one tool for everything. There's um, workforce, the workforce plans that councils do. A council doesn't say, oh, we'll just look at early years and we'll just workforce plan in that area. They do workforce plan for their whole um, council area. Um, but it's just nationally, there's probably a higher profile in these areas of early years and health and social care integration. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to move on in a second because I'm getting lost in my line of question. Dave Watson, I'll let you kind of finish off on where you think national workforce planning should go. But I, I'm just conscious that every year, and I understand this, and I say this every year as well, COSLA will identify pretty quickly the financial pressures that will come with a price bill to the Scottish Government in relation to how to meet the demands that are been placed on them by, by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government will come up with a completely different figure and eventually they, they reconcile that somehow. I'm just wondering if headcount and workforce numbers is part of that discussion, because that's the biggest cost to local authorities and service delivery is, is staffing. So, is there not support for a national workforce planning framework that can take into account these local nuances? Is it just not possible? Do we just let local authorities get on with it? Because local authorities, via COSLA, when they go to the Scottish Government to ask for cash, as they should do, of course, have to be able to get robust, reliable, strategic statistics. And if they can't, that weakens their argument with the Scottish Government, of course. So should there be some kind of national agreed framework? Well, I think... I guess just to respond in data, that local authorities can produce data on their workforce. So, you know, we do regularly give COSLA updates when they come requesting. I mean, we're on a number of councils on different um, HR systems, so the data might be in different, for but we provide it in a standard format for them. I don't know, maybe I'm not answering the question appropriately, I feel, but um, the, the data can be provided to COSLA on the workforce. Are there any, maybe the, the, the question just isn't, isn't focused enough and it's unrealistic and naive, but I have to ask it to be clear in my head whether it's it's possible or not. Dave, we'll take you in a second. Does anyone else want to add to that before I bring Mr Watson back Maybe in? it's in my simple mind. I, th I think for me it's about the direction of any funding and where that goes to make sure that we're, le we're meeting our local needs as well as our regional needs. And I think that's the challenge certainly that we hear through the public sector network where the different local authorities get together. We're looking at our youth employment strategies um, and there's certainly lots of strategies in place. An example of that could be the modern apprenticeships where we have training agreements for a year and we have funding for that. Sometimes maybe a year's not long enough to to, to get people ready for employability and employment. Does that make sense? So we might look for, for more funding to extend that. Um, work that we're doing through our care experience programme shown in Aberdeen Council and our own council as well. It's the commitment and the funding that, that we need for that and the length of time. Does that... I don't know if that's... No, 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 it's helpful and multi-year budgets is ringing about in my head whilst, whilst you're saying all that as well so you can plan ahead in relation to that. Dave Watson, do you want a final yeah. comment on that? Um, I, mean, I, th I mean, there are tools and I've referenced some of them in our, in our, in our written evidence, but they tend to be employer-based tools. Um, now, you can aggregate those up. Um, there are, I mean, 
you know, no one's a bigger champion of, of, of local determination than Uniston, but in a country of five million people, we accept that there is a need for frameworks. It's not about central direction, but we, uh, we do argue you start with some national frameworks. You remember the Christie Commission talked about the one public sector worker uh, at a, a, a approach. It talked about better coordination, particularly on training and education, so we had some common modules. Very little of that, frankly, has, uh, has, has happened. So I think there is a case for national workforce planning. I think, obviously, the government's fair work approach helps enormously in, in that area. So that's part of it. If you don't value the workforce, no one's going to want to work in, in the public sector. Data is a huge problem. Uh, you know, Sean rightly says, I mean, I, I'm involved in a whole range of initiatives, and we sit down with COS and we ask everybody for all the data, and it comes back in all sorts of different ways. And it's a hugely difficult job just to give some basic data together. Um, the other thing I'd argue is look at the whole workforce, not just the small ones. Yes, there is some, some silo-based national planning for care and for, for, for early years and so on. But there are lots of generic jobs in local government, and there are generic challenges. For example, um, we have whole groups of jobs where there is gender segregation. I take point made about, uh, about black and ethnic minorities as well. But gender segregation, only 3% of childcare workers are men. Um, you know, it's, it's about 13 or 14 percent in social care. You know, we need 65,000. You know, the, these these young women don't exist, folks. I'm afraid. So we have to break down gender segregation as an, and that's a national issue about how we how we do that. We need to build in what public service reform is into that process, which every local authority can't do. It's not in control of the big drives and the big changes like early years and education. And we do need to get those training providers around the table as well. So if you like, that's my six-point plan, um, which, uh, which I would argue makes the case for, uh, for, for a national approach, which is not directive, but it's a framework approach, which I think brings all the players together around the table and hopefully then develops uh, a, a longer-term plan plan for the for the workforce yeah, very helpful thank you very much um andy pikeman yeah, thanks very much convener um a few questions the, the public sector network um can you say a little bit about the sort of practical day-to-day -day work you're engaged in yes so can i give you a, a summary of the outcomes of of what the group are hoping to achieve or yes so yes. The, Traditionally, the group meets uh, biannually, and then there's steering groups and sub-working groups off of that that identify challenges. Some of the things that we're looking at at the minute um, are recruitment practices, um, how we attract people into roles, particularly within the, the local authorities and the public sector. Um, how can we increase our, our brand or our presence as an employer within the public sector? Um, you know, looking at identifying the challenges as to what stops people um, applying for, for roles in the public sector and how can we make that more attractive. Um, we're looking at our graduate apprenticeships and do they meet the needs um, within the local authorities and across the public sectors. Um, so particularly we have an area within teaching where we're struggling to recruit, so what can we do to influence the graduate apprenticeship programmes in that area. Um, there was a good example, um, I think I gave earlier, about the care experience work. Um, it was called Place and Train with Aberdeen Council, who looked at supporting people through um, care experience into employment, where they did six-week placements. Um, and we in North Lanarkshire Council, an example, are learning from that, and we are offering 12-month placement opportunities. So it's about, it's about learning from each other, looking at the challenges, how can we look at um, improving our pipelines of youth employment and how can we address some of those. Okay, that's helpful. So it's mainly focused on the young workforce? Yes, that, that's the main aim, main, yes. That's uh -huh. fine. Uh, now, Rebecca, you were talking about the challenges of uh, redressing the imbalance and representation from BME groups, in particular they're uh, more, more represented in younger people. Um, so <coughs> I'd like to ask, you know, Sarah, what the public sector network are doing about that, but maybe Rebecca, you have a better question you could ask Sarah. I don't know. <coughs> I'd be interested to hear. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Are there um, kind of specific working groups within the network that looks at kind of representation by ethnicity or specific initiatives that kind of target groups? Um, I saw from some evidence local councils submitted to an inquiry the Equalities Committee did a few years ago on um, race and ethnicity. Some a few councils had initiatives where they you know, would con advertise in um, specific newspapers or on radio stations. Um, 
have you heard any sort of work along those it's lines? One that I'm aware of, unfortunately, through the, the involvement that we have with the forum, but you can certainly find out. Yeah, it'd be yeah, really interesting. So I encourage you two to have a conversation yeah. about that because I think it is, is a very important issue. <coughs> uh, just um, moving on to um, some of the points Dave made about having kind of national frameworks um, to try and encourage better workforce planning, and I'm particularly taken by your comments about the small... We, we seem to have in, in local government um, social care, education, some very big workforces, and then, as you say, some very small but critically important um, workforces. Um, are there any good examples um, from the rest of the United Kingdom, British Isles, and Europe, where countries do that better? Because, I mean, right across Europe we have lots, lots more local government than we have here, delivering actually more services than they're delivered here, and, and how, how do they go about this? Uh, I, I, I don't think there are any in the UK that I'm aware of, although uh, in fairness to Wales, they have tried to, to, to do some work, and they had a One Wales project. It hasn't gone as quickly, I think, as some people hope to do so. They've certainly done more, for example, in the leadership area, you know, the Masters in Public Administration point I made earlier. Wales does have a very good programme developing. I was in Wales a few few months ago, a few weeks ago, and was very impressed by the work that was being done by universities and others down there. So. I think there has been an effort in Wales to coordinate some of that. Certainly not, I'm not aware of that in England if it's happening. In terms of European, the European model, um, obviously the German model is, is, is probably the well, most well known, is that they build in workforce planning to their sectoral bargaining arrangements. So that uh, if you went to, if you were sat the fly of the wall, the Scottish Joint Council uh, with us and COSLA, you'd hardly ever hear about workforce planning being discussed. If you went to the German equivalent, uh, you would find workforce planning, you know, best known probably in the manufacturing, the engineering areas, you know, they would be looking five and ten years ahead and saying, what are the developments in the sector? And these are very disparate, um, you know, mostly private sector, sector employers, but they all come round the table with the unions and sit down and do plan out. Now, you know, they don't always get it right. Um, you know, there's a big debate about, you know, is workforce planning a science or an art form? And uh, I, I probably fall more into the art form category, but there are people who, who disagree with me. But certainly in Europe, there, are, there is a, an effort, and remember, in local government in Europe, you're talking about a much larger number of local authorities, much smaller than ours are, uh, and yet they manage to coordinate some of that work and do some uh, some planning. So I suppose my my six point national framework plan would not be unusual in somewhere like Germany and other uh, European countries. It's not been the culture. Uh, in Scotland or the UK more generally, and I suppose uh, my argument is, based on the work, for example, the Fair Work Convention, um, it talked about having more sectoral approaches to workforce and so on in Scotland, and, and I think if we could develop that initiative, uh, particularly in local government, I think we would do a lot better. And are, are there times um, in the devolution era since 1999 when we've done workforce planning better? I mean, the convener talked about care work, and that's an expanding area. So obviously you have to do workforce planning if you want to get anywhere near mm -hmm. uh, recruiting that number of people. Um, and the budget was expanding in the first half of the parliament. Um, so have there been any changes over the last 18 years in this area or not? Uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, yes, uh, only very recently have we even looked at, at social care. And to be honest, it's been put in the too difficult box. You know, as I say in the evidence, you know, there are, there are 14,000 care providers in Scotland. You know, that's a hugely fragmented employer base. Uh, and it makes it a nightmare of a job just to pull data together, let alone anything else. Historically, I think that we have done it in silos, which again was one of the Christie Commission criticisms. I spent 18 months um, in the early years of devolution working in the health department. I did work on, on, um, on workforce planning there. Now, there you've got doctors, dentists and nurses all have their own workforce planners but nobody looked at anybody else and the minister said to me where's the first pressure and at the meeting I said well I've looked at it it's actually laundry managers nobody had looked at laundry managers all of whom were over 55 none of whom had a deputy and you can't run the hospital without laundry and nobody had bothered to look at it absolutely nobody uh, now that's my point that you know if you have comprehensive workforce planning 
you don't allow specific groups to fall between the net of the big the big planning arrangements and it's somebody's responsibility to join up and link up these things and the moment frankly there's nobody in government or elsewhere who are making that that joined up thinking okay and a question for for rebecca uh, thanks for your very comprehensive paper very very useful um what what's the problem here is there institutional racism that would be our line um, I think, especially if you look at, um, in local authorities, when you look at levels of application, they're nearly on par with kind of the national figure for what it should be. But there's, you know, a bit of a drop when you go to shortlisting and then a more severe drop when it comes to appointment. I think, um, might have highlighted in the evidence, sorry. Yeah, well, 31% of white, British, and Scottish, and 51% of um, non-white, non-British shortlisted applicants were appointed. Only 17.7% .7 of BME applicants were, which means that overall white applicants are about three times more likely to be successful in securing a post than BME applicants. I think the excuse given in a lot of these instances is on the supply side of things, and if you look through the public sector um, equality duty reports from the 2017 reporting round, a lot of outcomes that are focused on employment for local authorities are looking at um, making BME groups more employable. There's a big focus on translation services and ESOL provision. I think we would argue that those would be, you know, they are necessary for maybe some newer migrants regardless of race, but it doesn't discount for sort of the figures that we're seeing here. Um, from some analysis we've done of the 2017 reporting figures, if you don't mind if I just grab those. Um, in 2013, about 1% of local authority staff were from a BME background, and that's only at 1.5% now in 2017, four years later, um, when you know local authorities were tasked to gather information on um, ethnicity in terms of recruitment and then use that information to lay out plans to sort of improve it. Um, we really haven't seen much work done at a strategic level. A lot of work in kind of an anti-racism sense is on unconscious bias training. Um, the report from the Equal Opportunities Committee that was published in 2015 that I referenced earlier um, found that unconscious bias training wasn't a very helpful approach. Um, it's not, sorry. Sorry. Go, go ahead. Um, just finally, on this line of questioning, um, and we've seen increasing attention paid to the uh, need to get people with disabilities into the workforce as well, more effectively. So my question is, and this is just because I don't know anything about the topic, um, would workforce planning normally include the need to support um, greater equality in the workforce, not just for BME, but for, would that be a normal thing that workforce planning would do? Or is that an equalities issue and seen separate from workforce planning? Very much should be core to workforce planning, not least because there are numbers of workforce. I mean, we've got you know, large numbers of people um, who are in that 50 to 65, despite all the ageing workforce, who aren't in the job and would like to be in the job because there's a largely partly because of disability and health, but others because there's unconscious bias with the older workforce as, as, as well. Uh, so, you know, if you've got groups of workers uh, who you could tap into to, to address your workforce planning issues, then if they're not coming, they're not being recruited, as clearly they're not in the in the field that, that we've been talking about this morning, then you need to build that into your workforce planning. And you have to have very specific plans in terms of training. You know, if middle managers, you know, if they're not trained in issues like you know, recruiting people from black and, uh, and, uh, and ethnic minorities, then what happens is you get, I point, people who look like me. Uh, that's what happens, um, you know, and I've seen this in the private and the public sector, where I've walked into places and said, and said, why have we got so few in an area where there's clearly a workforce out there? And in fairness, when HR and managers say, that's a good point, Dave, yeah, and you then put in measures like training, awareness and monitoring, 
you do get results. I could point you, I won't name them, but I could point you a very big private sector company in Glasgow who did a big program and turned over literally in, the, in an area where there are a high level of black and ethnic minorities and they turned their, their recruitment around as a result of the right program. But it took, as it were, someone just to say, hang on, that doesn't look right. And workforce planning should tell you that from the numbers, the sort of numbers that we've got here today. The 2017 reporting round of the public sector equality duties that they should be aware. Um, you know, these duties have existed for a while, um, predating the Equality Act. You know, there was an impetus to collect data on ethnicity, and we haven't, we've hardly seen any change in 10 years. So I think they've been aware that there is a problem. I agree they should, they should happen as part of workforce planning, but we're not seeing much evidence that it does or that it's happening on a level that's high enough for it to be effective. Um, and just um, Graham, for a supplementary in relation to this, but I'm just conscious of Sharon and Dick and Sarah Tennant's not the opportunity to say maybe about what that is happening on the ground. So maybe after Graham's supplementary, you might be able to put some of that on the record and you're the next line of questioning, Monica. Graham. Yeah, um, I, I, mean, I was very struck by the, the, the figures in the, the, the teaching uh, workforce. Um, so if we look at sort of Glasgow City Council, B, BME population, 11.6%. BME teachers, 3.4. Edinburgh, population, 8.3. Teachers, <coughs> 1.5. Aberdeen, population, 8.1. Teachers, 2.2. And so, so it goes on. Um, and you could make the same argument uh, for, for gender in, well, primary schools are a good example. Lots of female teachers, not, not very many male. So do you think councils uh, should have specific policies to, to, to rectify this so that the, the, the teaching population better reflects the, the actual population? Well, anyone. Rebecca, and then we'll give Sharon Dick and Sarah Tennant an opportunity to see what, what is happening in their areas. Rebecca. Sure. And again, I don't work for a local authority, so I wouldn't, these plans might exist, but I guess. Um, they're certainly not well highlighted in their public sector equality duty reports if they are there. I think the Equality Act has resulted in kind of um, a move to sort of generalize equality. And so you'll see in a lot of these reports, we don't have any problem with recruitment. You know, we've looked and there's no discrimination. There's not a problem. We have um, kind of generic equality working groups that look at these issues and it's fine. But kind of this more general approach overlooks um, issues that might pop up for gender or for disability or for race in particular. And I think, you know, teachers is one area where that's a really clear problem. Um, if, you know, BME students aren't seeing BME teachers, it becomes a less appealing or, you know, career to pursue. There's less people going into teacher training, which results in lower numbers of teachers. I think there needs to be a much more concerted and focused approach on how we're going to improve the workforce. And these figures are taken from, you know, a census that was done in 2011. So by, we would estimate that the BME population has, you know, at least doubled in some areas since. So in reality, these figures are much more disparate than they seem. Okay. So here are a lot of challenges. I'm just wondering, Sharon, you're involved in a lot of the planning across 30 local authorities, you, 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 I think you mentioned. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say I would know all the detail of the 30 yeah, local no, authorities, but, but you might I have can, an example of some things a... on the ground where this has been looked at, perhaps. Yeah, I, I think to, to respond to Rebecca, I mean, the figures are the figures, so there is an issue. I think it'd be wrong to sit here and say, you know, we are we have equality across the board, because we don't, and we, we, we know it's an area that we need to work on. I mean, I think even looking around this room, you can see it's an issue. So... Um, uh, we have protected characteristics in a number of areas. Um, if you look at the, you know, it covers not just um, BM, um, you know, um, sorry, black and ethnic minorities. We've got issues with age, we've got issues with disability. One of the issues local authorities are trying to tackle through, and I do agree that equality in the mainstream report should just be part of workforce planning. It shouldn't be something separate we talk about. We should just be looking at it, integrating it, and make sure we do it. Um, but one of the things you know that we are doing is trying to actually encourage people to declare. Local authorities do have an issue with this as well. So um, I think that was highlighted in your report as well. There's quite a lot of um, actual employees who won't declare um, the, the fields and you know and what their ethnicity is, etc. 
and we need to get that more known. I think there is data there for recruitment and some local authorities are starting to look at that. So the points that um, Rebecca's raised, I'm not saying we've got a lot of them have got completed actions, but I think there's a lot of work that's now starting to look at is there bias at short leading and more councils in fact through um, the systems that we use now actually you can't tell who the person is so actually it's now more at interview stage that we need to work on so how do we make sure that we you know we don't we don't have unconscious bias happening there um, there is a number of um, actions getting taken round about recruitment there also needs to be um, and this is something that there's difficulty, and I'm actually going to catch up with Rebecca after this, because if she's got ideas, I'm keen to hear them. Um, but we, we know uh, locally there's issues with recruitment, because there's quite a lot of um, people, and we get this feedback through our equality managers, worked a lot with their local communities. A lot of our black and ethnic minorities don't want to come and work in local government. They don't see it as a career. Um, and that's an issue as well. So, um, as I say, I'm going to follow up with Rebecca to see how can we tackle some of that. Um, so there is a number of paths um, that are ongoing, not just with um, um, ethnicity, we're also looking at disability, trying to make our workplaces more accessible um, and there's more flexibility, with us, I guess, with us moving to a more agile workforce, which a lot of the, um, the councils have now, that has helped break down barriers and it is making the workforce more flexible to help support people with different um, needs in the workplace. Okay, thanks. Well. Sarah, I don't know if you want to add anything. Just very quickly on this sort of the supported employment piece, there is a lot of work going on on the ground which we've identified through the network to help people with disabilities get into work, whether that's from youth or, or other ages. Um, and uh, you know, I'll go back to you know, it's difficult for individuals to navigate all of the support partners and everything that's out there. So our, our work is to look at well, actually, how can we work together? How can we collaborate under these um, increasingly um, financial pressure times to optimise the resources that are out there from the different support partners and put good frameworks in place that we actually see progress for people around the area of supported employment, if that okay. makes sense. Graham, did you want to follow up any more on that? No. Okay. Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, convener. I think earlier on, Sharon Dick really got to the heart of it. I think you sort of said the discussion matters because it's, it's about communities and it's about outcomes and notwithstanding the, the legal duties that, that Rebecca has, has clearly touched on, I think we would all agree that the local government workforce should reflect the communities um, that, that it serves. But in terms of the diversity of the, the workforce, it's not really a, you know, a good picture. But the question that I had, I think maybe Sharon's now partly answered it in terms of people not declaring their, their ethnic background. But in the written submission that we have from, from Rebecca from the Coalition for Racial Equalities and Rights, there's a huge variation in terms of the, the data that is available. So, for example, the ethnic background of almost 60% of Eastern Bartonshire Council employees is unknown, almost 60%, whereas in East Renfrewshire, um, that figure <coughs> is much lower, at just under 14%. So, Rebecca, I wonder if you can maybe say something about, about data collection, but also this sort of a under-reporting or, or, or not declaring what, what, what's actually going on there? I think it's important to distinguish between um, people who on their forms have ticked that they prefer not to declare and people and just figures that are unknown. I think there might be some instances with you know those who prefer not to say that there's maybe uncertainty about how the data might be used. I think that's just a matter of you know kind of emphasizing what the data's for, kind of the protections that are around it. Um, local authority figures for um, people declaring that they prefer for not to declare their ethnicity went from 8.6% in 2013 to 10.4% in 2017. So a slight increase, but not not large. The bigger, much bigger problem is with a known, which was at 20.8% in 2013 and 23.8% in 2017. Um, I guess, again, I would just say the public sector equality duties have, have been in place and there is the requirement to gather this information people taking that they prefer not to say is one thing, but there's a much larger issue with why are so many of these these figures still unknown. I would caution that there's no evidence to indicate that, um, you know, all the BME people are, we just don't know about, and that's why these figures are low. I think you're, you'll find even in local authorities and other public bodies where declaration rates are high and unknown rates are low, it's a consistent picture, which is in line with, you know, national figures around un underemployment and unemployment. Um, so there is 
kind of a, a question about why why so much is unknown and why has filling in those gaps not been made more of a priority? Has that answered your question? No, that, that, that's helpful. I mean, it does feel like there are unresolved issues around around uh, data. I mean, Rebecca, I don't know if you have a view on the the UK race disparity audit that that was commissioned and the Scottish government um, elected not to be part of that. Are there, are there other lessons that we can learn? I mean, for example, was that an opportunity missed or do we have enough systems, you know, embedded in Scotland? I think we would have been in favour of participation in the audit. Bringing data to light is always a good thing um, for a variety of reasons that wasn't the path the Scottish government chose. Um, I think their emphasis is maybe more on the equality evidence finder that they have and kind of revising their equality evidence strategy. I think that's more about bringing data that exists to a central place where people can find it and use it and analyze it. I think the problem still is some of that data is just not known and some public bodies are just not making the efforts that need to be made to, to fill in those gaps and answer those questions. And I guess through reading some um, PSCD reports, we find that you know, well, we don't see an issue with discrimination because figures are so low. And I guess you question if the figures were a bit higher, if it would be a bit easier to identify that there are those issues. Maybe it's um, some groups might just rather not know. Thank you. That's helpful. And then thinking about, about outcomes and why a lot of this actually matters. So in terms of whether it's Scottish government national strategy and, and, and outcomes or regional and local strategy. So this committee has been looking at city region deals, for example, and the concept of inclusive growth. Um, but if workforces are not very inclusive, you start to see there can be a, a, a disconnect. Um, that brings me to some of the, the, the specialist roles that the, um, Dave Watts and Sharon Dick other, you know, have touched on in terms of um, planners. And I'll again declare my interest as a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute, and I can I, I no totally relate to what I, no I know. I'd be a bit surprised with the convener, but can completely relate to the story that, that, that Dave Watson has relayed about um, the, the planning school in Glasgow shutting down, which I'm sure is no reflection on my time there, I hope. But in terms of trading standards and, you know, building standards and so on, you know, these are jobs that if people don't turn up for their work, you know, basically people could die because buildings are not being inspected, environmental health, um, restaurants are not being inspected. So it, it is quite troubling and having, like other colleagues, been a local councillor and worked in local government, you know, it, it's quite troubling that, that when people are doing workforce reporting or, you know, workforce planning that, you know, the serious... Um, consequences of not having enough people in these roles. So um, I know there's been a, a discussion already can be done on national coordination, but surely that, that's really, really critical, particularly when we've seen, you know, what, what happens when when there are fires in city centres or, you know, in parts of Lanarkshire where, where people have died as a result of, you know, poor hygiene in and, and, and butchers and, and, and local bakers in the high street. You know, what what will it take to get that higher up the political agenda? I, I mean, I, I, sadly, it, it does tend to be, you know, when something, you know, hits us between the hours too late in the day. The example I gave of planning was was earlier was an example of that. Um, you know, obviously, building control suddenly gets a focus because of Grenfell. Um, and, you know, and obviously, we had a big look at environmental health a number of years ago after the Wisher outbreak and, and other issues. So, sadly, what tends to happen is some big event happens and people go, why did this happen? And then everyone goes, well, actually, you know, um, in building control, we're, we're carrying 65 um, vacancies, you know, with staff are spending all their time filling in bits of paper to report to the to the Scottish Government and not doing inspections on the ground. You know, these are things which 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 come up come up later. I think in terms of being where where we go, I think that you know, we, we simply can't do planning and workforce planning on the back of crisis. You know, we've essentially got to have that sort of structured thing I was talking about earlier. I think, um, you know, there are challenges I mentioned, you know, to Alexander Stewart's point about uh, about private sector leakage, which, which is difficult to, to manage. But even even things like getting people career pathways, for, for, for example, um, I, just to test it this morning on the train over from uh, from, from Ayrshire, um, I, I'd 
I tested to see if I wanted to be a trading standards officer, um, and uh, I'm a bit late in the day for it, but if I wanted to be a trading standards officer, and I went through, I Googled it, I went through the World at Work website and all the rest of it, it was pretty difficult to, um, uh, to, to know where I was going to get um, the training course, should I do a degree, should I get a trainee job, you know, there were bits there, I'm not saying there was nothing there, but you'd have to be pretty determined, and uh, yeah, a friend of mine happens to be a training standards officer, and, you know, and his son's going to be one, but you know, that, we can't rely, frankly, on family connections, and I suspect uh, very few other people would have, would have, most young people would have given up the ghost uh, to being a training standards officer by the time they ploughed through that system. So I do think we, we do need, to, workforce planning, I would hope, would not just be about producing lots of numbers, it would be about delivering some actions, which might say, well, how can we improve um, the, uh, the, 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 the approaches there? Government can help, because the government's got levers here. You know, you talked about city region deals. Procurement is another one. Obviously, we've argued with the Fair Work Convention about doing that. Funding streams, um, you know, where you can, where you can in incentivise to use Bob's early, earlier point. So I think there are there are way, ways of doing that. But I think the my key message would be, you know, start early. Don't wait for a crisis to happen. And just as a final um, line of questioning, I think going back to, I think Rebecca talked about um, equality impact assessments earlier on. Um, I don't know maybe if, if Sharon and, and Sarah can maybe see something um, about this, but when there's workforce reporting or there's workforce planning or there's decisions that are taken at budget time and there's efficiencies and there's, there's, there's posts that disappear and, you know, you know are, are we getting really robust equality impact assessments? I mean, it still feels like quite often it's it's like a box it's it's been ticked and, and committees of councils are told oh yeah yeah there's been an equality impact assessment but they don't really pour over the detail of that because it's buried in about you know 500 pages of, of of committee papers and recently this committee um, has been scrutinising the, the the planning bill and in gender uh, said that the equalities impact assessment that went with that with that bill was was very poor um, and that that would lead to um, you know, further constraints in terms of how do we plan the built environment and do that in an inclusive way and, and respect the diversity of, of our population. So is there, do we have the right skill set around, um, you know, doing good equalities impact assessment and how does that then feed into an informed workforce planning? Sure, I take it first. Um, equality impact assessments, I mean, I obviously can't say across all 32 councils but I know um, equality impact assessments are done for any change be that through budget changes or a change to terms or condition or a major policy change and, and that should always be carried out um, but I think one issue I, that I would say for equality impact assessments is they're not always in the same format I know they're looking for on, like, the online tool and, um, and I think that will help because I think then it's easier to actually see the content rather than try to work out the, the structure of the report. So I think quality impact assessments should be focused and should be very clear what it's highlighting and there should be good data in them. Um, I know the unions, Dave will say, the unions always challenge us in a quality impact assessment. So if we, if we don't do one, um, we soon get asked the question. So it is an area that, that is a focus um, but, and we, we do take appropriate action out of them as well. I've got one final question, but Rebecca, yeah. I think just a few things I would highlight about equality impact assessments. Um, I think it really depends on, on what time in a planning it's done. If it's done at the beginning, you can be proactive, you can build equality into the way that you're planning and looking at things. If it's done at the end and the result of the EQI is, oh, it'll, it'll result in the same outcomes for everybody. Okay. On one sense, I would question whether that's true, but in another way, if it's resulting in the same outcomes for everybody, the same problems are going to perpetuate. And I guess I would also note you were talking about the skill of people doing the impact assessments. I know the EHRC produces a lot of guidance and I'm sure can assist in cases like that, but if an under if a BME underrepresented workforce is doing impact assessments on the impact it might have on BME communities, I think there might be the potential for some significant oversights, um, which is why it's important to have a diverse workforce so you can be cognizant of diverse issues. Shandick, of course. Can I yeah. just respond to that? I, I just said I would totally concur with that and also agree because the quality impact assessments and one of my discussions is it's not, it's a live document. 
they needed to continue through the whole process. So it should start, but should get revisited through the process. And also would emphasise and encourage for us all, it needs to be as a group exercise, not just one person sitting in a room doing it as a tick box exercise. Okay, thank you. And you'd have final question, Monica? Yeah, it was just going back to, to Dave Watson's earlier comments about the impact of austerity on local government and the fact that since 2009 there's been 29,000 job losses. That's an awful lot of people with a lot of experience of local government who have gone out the door. I just wonder if, if the panel can say something about um, you know, the people who have left in terms of exit interviews, feedback that those, those people have given. What uh, what is local government learning and what I suppose is Scotland learning about those people who have who have left local government and how is that uh, influencing and informing you know decisions that we're taking now and, and, and into the future any takers on that question Dave Watson yeah uh, I mean I, I mean it is it is a simple fact that you we are losing lots of people with lots of experience and I think it's important to understand I think we, there's a tendency for us to pick a the big groups and also to to pick some of the specific groups we've mentioned today including planners um, but there are uh, actually a, quite a lot of generic jobs in local government administrative jobs etc um, where yeah again there can be leakage to uh, to other parts of the of the economy and these are important jobs they're often forgotten but you know we've done surveys which show that you know social workers and planners and architects engineers bemoan the fact that they've got no administrative support so they spend all their time filling in bits of paper that used to be done by by other people and frankly half the cost as well in in, uh, in 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 other areas so we shouldn't forget the generality that's why i think attracting people in local government the interesting point when we look to some of the data and then you know I keep, we keep saying the data is poor but one of the interesting points is if you look at how the twenty nine thousand jobs losses have been managed um, they haven't obviously the, the 60 to 65 year olds were not the natural wastage there's actually a lot of people under 50 have gone and they haven't gone with pensions because you can't get your pension until you're at least 55 some cases 50 but generally it's 55 so these are not people who are going generally speaking councils are very reluctant to let 50 to 60 year olds because they're very expensive to let go in pension terms you have the, the what called strain costs uh, which are quite expensive so actually what we're finding you look at the numbers is lots of people under 50 are voluntarily going just with a basic you know redundancy package but they've got other jobs so they're not going into retirement and pick up the slippers they're going to work in other sectors and i think if we looked at some of the reasons why they've decided not to stay in local government in many ways that would tell you more than somebody of my age who says frankly you give us a pile of money i'm going to retire and that's great um i think you want to look at the under 50s who are leaving local government and see what uh, what's what's necessary there the other consequence for workforce planning, uh, which isn't well understood, is we have a huge level of delaying in, 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 in local government. That's been done to try and save money. But what you tend to find is departments are now multidisciplinary departments. So the head of protective services might be an environmental health officer, but not a training standards officer, which means training standards in that department is actually quite a junior member of staff. And there have been a number of rather well, sadly well publicised problems that have arisen as a result of this so what you lose with experience is the collective knowledge it's not just about skills and training it's also about knowledge i know what happened in the past um, i know that this works I've done, i know the area we lose that collective knowledge at our peril and in senior levels we are now talking about quite junior staff who are struggling because uh, they haven't got the experience and you know to be able to make those big strategic decisions additional comments on that? Charles Dick, yes. I guess to emphasise Dave's point, but I think local authorities are trying to do a lot of succession planning um, to alleviate some of the problems. So the points Dave's made are very valid. So we are losing a lot of knowledge. Um, they are trying to identify, I guess, risk areas where we maybe get a single point of failure for one person doing a job, which is happening because we've had budget cuts. So councils are looking at that to try and make sure there's better resilience by doing succession plan over a number of years and trying to, um, where people have indicated they want to retire. This is more for people that are choosing to retire or choosing to say, I will go as a voluntary redundancy in a year's time. We're putting better plans in place now. Um, but there is issues with the knowledge and there is issues with multiple roles. Um, a lot of the restructures councils are having to do because of budget limitations means that we're restructuring with the people we have internally 
and people are now spread thin over maybe multiple um, roles. And that is something that's coming out in exit interviews. Some people do choose to leave because they want to remain true to, in fact, I'm picking on planning because we know it's a topic, um, it appeals, but um, they want to be a planner, they don't want to be a planner who manages environmental health and trading standards. So th there is people making the type of choices as well. Okay, we're going to have to move on to our, our next line. Of, is, is it a supplementary on this? I've got you for a new line of question. Yes, yeah, so I've got Jenny Gorouth, MSP first, and then I'll t I'll, there's plenty of time. I'll take you. Jenny, uh, Jenny Gorouth. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd just like to go back to revisit the uh, early learning and childcare um, in terms of workforce planning. Um, because I've, I've had representation from the Scottish Childminding Association recently who are pretty concerned about local authorities who don't engage with using childminders to provide the entitlement. Uh, and they published a report last year which showed that only 15 local authorities across the country were using childminders um, to deliver on the entitlement. And Fife Council are one of the ones who aren't using it. So I just wanted to ask more broadly, are some councils better than others at working with partners in terms of workforce planning? That might be Sharon Dick again here. Um, um, I feel I probably can't comment on that because I don't have enough local knowledge of each local authority. Um, but I'm sure there will be variation across from council to council. But I don't probably have a wide enough picture to comment on that. Sorry. Does Unison? Yeah, see, we represent that that group work because I think there's the, the, there obviously we. This is a good example of public service reform, big expansion. You know, we need lots of extra people, so we sit down and we say that. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we've, we've had a look at it, and some of the areas, I mean, that we've looked at, and we've said to Scottish Government, look, the reason, for example, there's a difference in numbers um, is because we think uh, the Scottish Government's assuming too many full-time staff going to be working in this area, whereas our experience is a lot of childcare workers uh, are actually part-time workers delivering. They make that choice. It's part of the reason 97% of them are women, uh, and uh, that in itself is, is a challenge that needs to, needs to be broken down. Uh, in terms of the, the, obviously, the sort of three levels of, 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 of childcare provider, there is a local authority provision which is the one which is largely the best qualified therefore generally speaking staff there are uh, our hnc hnd or to, to manage a unit you must be degree qualified now so you tend to, and obviously therefore they pay better so therefore it's undoubtedly the case that what happens is that when you when you need to expand very quickly inevitably people go to the to the better paid also where they get proper training as well so there there is the partnership nurseries uh, which is the new area there where the government's talking about paying, they've got to pay the living wage in, in that area. You know, the, trouble, the trouble is the living wage is, is just totally inadequate for somebody who should be qualified to HNC, HND level. What male-dominated job would that be an acceptable uh, level, level of pay? And the answer is none. You know, if it was a job aimed at in construction or anything, they, they, they wouldn't even consider the living wage as being an appropriate wage for that level of qualification. And then you've got the sort of the basic level, uh, which is not getting that element of, of, of government funding and the you know the economic model in that area not everywhere is uh, is 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 pretty poor you know it tends to be 16 17 year olds and then are encouraged out because you've again got to pay the national minimum wage for the higher age group surveys have been done which shows that even supervisory staff in those nurseries are not getting the living wage uh, and um, you know the, there's a reluctance to pay the higher age rates even with the national uh, minimum wage so there are are, you know, some very major problems in, in, in that area. There is also an issue, and it's a, it's a, what is the purpose of education and childcare? You know, is it to uh, help you know, mothers and fathers be able to have better access to the workforce, or is it about an intervention with the very youngest people, which we know Sorry to go back, Christy. I was a, an advisor to it, but you know, Christy pointed about the interventions that can be made that that are, are crucial to tackling inequality. So I think it's probably a bit of both, but I, I don't think the workforce planning around that has taken into account. And I've just given you off the top of my head four or five factors which I don't think have been properly factored into the expansion of early years. But if we had proper workforce planning, those are the sort of things that we'd be talking about right at the outset of the of the policy, not when we've got to deliver some pretty big numbers next year. Yeah, I suppose the concern from the Scottish Child Mining Association is that some, in some local authorities, their services are just not being used at all. Um, and I also take your point with regard to the purpose of childcare, but certainly from my own experience in terms of child minders, they, they do have a role to play. And it's not just about being babysitters. It's so much more than that. Um, 
Sharon Dick, you spoke about restructuring um, with regard to um, local authorities and uh, particularly in Fife at the moment we have an issue around about admin staff where the council are restructuring uh, admin staff in schools which are predominantly female roles and often not very well paid. At the same time, in April of this year, it was reported that Fife Council has five execs on salaries of more than £100,000, with the chief exec reportedly earning more than the First Minister and the Prime Minister. So I just wonder then to what extent you might have a view, and Dave Watson, this is perhaps another one for you, with regard to capping council execs' salaries. Um, I see Mr Watson scribbling furiously in, in relation to that. It's worth putting on the record, Mr Watson, before you answer that, we'll come to you first, I take it, um, that uh, this, this committee uh, was pretty unanimous that a uh, chief executive should not be the additional monies f to be returning officers at elections either. It's perhaps worth putting that on the record for a bit of a, a theme emerging from, from this committee over over a period of time, Mr Watson? Something we, we welcomed at the time as well. We agree that you know you should pay the rate for the job and not start splitting things up into bits and pieces. So I, so I think that was absolutely right. I suppose, um, you know, uh, and I'm not always fair to chief officers in, in, in local government, they, or they might say that. Uh, I, I do have to say that if you look at uh, equivalent responsibilities in terms of size, the scale of the workforce, the budget size, etc., that chief officers in local government do not look overpaid, it has to be said. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's, there's, there's any doubt about that. I deal and have deal dealt with some of the biggest private sector companies in, in Scotland. And you know, I, I know people who have come into the public sector and said, hang on, you know, I'm having to take a very big pay cut to do a job which is actually bigger than the one I was doing in the private sector. So I think that I would have to say that I think um, some of the comparisons are not entirely fair on, on chief officers. Having said that, um, there's always a but. And uh, my, my but in this context, we are in favour of pay ratios. Um, uh, I think there is a very strong argument, as the, the High Pay Commission uh, in their reports have highlighted, that there should be pay ratios in the workforce, and not ones that can be manipulated, as they often are in the private sector, by outsourcing low-paid jobs. So therefore, you tweak the numbers. Uh, so I think pay ratios, but my, my answer would be we should do it in the private sector as well as the public sector, because I think that's only, only fair and fair and reasonable. Any additional comments from others in, in relation to that? I, I appreciate the reluctance there may be in, an, in, in, ans in answering that question, but you've put on the record, uh, Ms Gore, with your concerns in that area. Is there anything you want to add before I take Mr Gibson in? Just a final question. Um, public procurement was mentioned earlier, and I think in response to a line of questioning from Monica Lennon, and public procurement is one of the 24 powers the British government are currently proposing to retain uh, following Brexit, which will directly impact upon the powers of this parliament. Um, I wonder then how well are local authorities uh, preparing in terms of Brexit with regard to workforce planning? I, I knew we'd get to Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Briefed on this, <laughs> inevitable this would be asked at some yeah. point. Um, we might give you a little bit of a rest, Mr Watson. Uh, does anyone else want to commence on that, Sharon Dick? I respond to that. Um, Obviously, Brexit is an issue for the workforce. Um, we are looking at it. We Each council just now is looking to see how much of their workforce is affected by it. Um, Edinburgh City Council in particular have got the biggest issue, we think, um, at this point in time. Um, we're concerned about it with our diversity. And we're concerned that people will choose to you know, not stay in roles that maybe come to study in Scotland and maybe choose to go back. And we're concerned that people who are actually a bit longer term will choose to, to return um, to their home country as well. Um, so the stage that we're at just now is, as I say, assessing the workforce to see what the level of impact is. COSLA are actually pulling together um, a, the, the metrics on that to, so that we can see an overall impact in Scotland. Um, and we're also trying to make sure that we can put the appropriate support in place for our employees who are affected by it so that we can help support them through the process, which is quite cumbersome. Um, so it is the form, I can't remember how many pages, but it's it's not an easy form to complete. So we're trying to make sure that across the country that we've got appropriate support in place for people so that we can try and get them um, citizenship now um, ahead of Brexit. And then we'll obviously do continuing support for what we need to do as it progresses. But it's yeah. a big concern. Sarah, did you want I, to no, I would just concur Sorry. with that Sorry. from the knowledge that I have through the network group that that's going on. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mr Watson? Um, I, actually, before, apologies, before you so ask this, Mr. Because, because for time constraints, I, I think we should maybe ask this as well, because it is budget scrutiny, of course, and that Brexit is an incredibly relevant question to ask. If there's going to be emerging cost pressures in relation to planning for Brexit and the the um, fallout from Brexit, then 
the, this is a budget scrutiny session, of course. Um, it's only fair to set this within the context of the UK government talking about, um, not language I would ever use, a Brexit, Brexit dividend and all this additional cash that there's going to be. Personally, I don't see what's going to come from myself, but that's not the job of this committee to analyse that. It is the job of this committee to look at additional cross pressures on local authorities. And if those are emerging because of Brexit, and we're looking at budget scrutiny, we have to look at where the finance to support that comes from. So that might be helpful in any response that you give as well, Mr Watson. Yeah, I, I, I will remember the day after the, the referendum waking up and going in my office and saying, we need to find out how many uh, EU nationals there are in Scotland working in the public sector, uh, and even how many were Uniston members. And of course, you know, there was no data for the reasons that have been indicated, self-declaration, even in areas where we have relatively good workforce data like the NHS. It was self-declaration and we just had this huge number of don't declare. Uh, I think we do have to ask questions of why people of, of particular ethnic uh, backgrounds don't declare their ethnicity, not on the interviews, but when they get to work, they're still not filling them in in terms of annual surveys, etc. So I, I'm, a, I'm a bit uncomfortable and slightly worried about that. Um, I think the, the, the pressures, um, you know, we'd, we've done quite a lot of work, particularly in the, in the social care sector. We've worked with Scottish Government Project on interviewing. We've got about 6,000 members, Uniston members in Scotland who are EU nationals. We, my team's been out doing face-to-face -face and, and telephone interviews as part of a project the Scottish Government is gradually releasing some of the information about what they feel about it. And, and you know, it, much of it you expect, um, but the sense of feeling of being let down and not wanted in Scotland um, you know, not just in Scotland, the UK generally, but obviously we're interviewing Scottish members, um, and this this sense of you know almost rejection, um, and we know in the care sector that this is adding to the turnover issues, which have cost and clearly workforce planning. So any workforce planning has to include Brexit uh, in there. Let's all remember, however, that we had problems in the care sector before Brexit. Uh, Brexit has just added to those particular problems. Um, I think the procurement point that Jenny Cruz made is, is a very is a very fair one. It's one of the you know a lot of people focused in the in the debate about powers on new stuff coming from uh, from the from the from the EU. Uh, but one of the problems with the UK government's approach to this is that the headings actually don't just include uh, powers coming from these include powers that we already have in Scotland and procurement is the one that worries me more than anything else um, that, uh, that, that essentially they have the powers now to start laying down you know, we have a separate legislation in Scotland we have separate uh, separate regulations in Scotland in relation to procurement now they don't include everything I asked for in you know Scottish government in my view, didn't go anywhere near far enough with some key areas over procurement, but they are still more progressive and more interventionist than you will get in most other parts of the UK. Uh, so um, I think they are better, and I am very concerned. The last thing on earth I want is a UK government that doesn't understand Scotland, doesn't understand our sectors and the, you know, the tighter areas. They're starting to put one size fits all policies and regulations in place in relation to procurement. So uh, I think that's a very big worry for us uh, because procurement is one of the areas, particularly in social care when 60% is essentially outsourced already, where we need to make interventions to get that right. So um, I, I would hope the uh, workforce planning would take Brexit into account in the big way. Okay. Any other comments on that? Okay. Jenny Gorris, want to follow up on anything there? Thank you. Okay, uh, very patient, Mr. Gibson. Kenneth Gibson, MSP. He's very much uh, convener. Loads of uh, things I want to, would want to ask about. I mean, really, it has been a fascinating discussion. One thing though, that hasn't really come up yet, convener, so far as uh, the Scottish government's policy of no compulsory redundancies. I'm just wondering how that's impacted on workforce planning. <laughs> it's, it's a good question. I mean, it, it inevitably, it means the policy of no compulsory redundancy, of course, do, largely doesn't apply in local government. So that's the first thing to make make the point that we have had compulsory redundancies in local government. Um, not many, in fairness. Um, and, uh, uh, and and there's always a debate about whether redundancy is compulsory or voluntary or whether it's Hobson's choice uh, in, so, in, so, in, so, in some cases. Um, what a lot of authorities do is that, you know, if you've, if you've made a change, you've made a restructuring, try and say, money then what you end up is with some spare people and you put them in a pool and you try and reallocate
Kate, you do retraining and you spend some time time doing that. Generally speaking, that's a form of workforce planning. Um, uh, and I think, fairness, local authorities have sadly become very experienced in doing that and do it generally fairly well. Um, so that uh, we do that. And it's not just in local government, in the public sector more, more broadly. So we have avoided despite losing 20, 29,000 staff, we have avoided you know, very significant numbers of, of compulsory redundancies, and we haven't been able to reaccommodate through retraining, uh, through upskilling in many cases. That's, that's, that's sort of the workforce. Yeah, an HR director might well say to you, oh, well, that's an additional challenge. You know, if you were in another industry, you just sort of basically sack everybody, and it's nice and easy. Uh, in local government and in, uh, and in most of the public sector, it requires a degree of challenge. So I think unions and HR people in, in the public sector are probably better at doing this than my experience in the private sector because we have constraints uh, and there's also cost factors. You know, I mean, it's expensive to let people go uh, and so therefore you don't want to do it unless you absolutely have to. Uh, so I think we've developed some pretty good techniques. It's not perfect, but I think that's an element of workforce planning we probably do rather well. How, how does it impact on efficiency, though? For example, in one department, you've got a surge of people who want voluntary redundancies, and then there might be, you know, might be an impact in morale for those who want those redundancies and are not able to get them. And then you've got other departments where, frankly, the, the local authority would like to be able to reduce the headcount, but people maybe aren't too keen to leave. Yeah. I, I, it is a problem uh, if you offer up voluntary redundancy and there are lots of people who want to go and people get then that's pretty demoralizing because you're essentially putting it out there that you want to go um i'd have to say that was probably more an issue in you know post austerity in the early years it's less of an issue today to be honest uh, kenny i think the uh, i would say to you that uh, and, and equally it tends to be the case you, you can always have the exception where there'll be clusters but you know it's it's not a massive problem there will be problems in individual authorities at different times uh, i'd also be happy to i think we've had a tendency for local authorities to consume their own smoke in some of these areas and i think one of the one worker approach might enable us to do a little bit of of cross work there i was doing a meeting the other day with social care workers and was impressed by the number of former steel workers and in manufacturing industry folk who are now men uh, of you know, my sort of age who are working in, um, in, the, in the social care sector. And you know, efforts to retrain those, et cetera, to get them into those areas can work, but you've got to make those jobs attractive and you've really got to start doing some very early work with these people to say, look, you know, have you thought about retraining? This isn't a more attractive career than you might think it is and do that sort of work. It's not, it is a challenge, but I don't think it's a massive one and not one that, frankly, should be beyond us to manage in HR and, and trade unions together. You know, on the, on the early years, I was quite interested in the, the, the questions that uh, were asked by Jenny there and your responses. In North Ayrshire, they're rolling out a pilot of 1140 hours but, uh, in the three towns, but what they're only doing is they're only rolling it out to local authority nurseries. So what that basically means is that uh, you know, partnership nurseries are losing staff, and indeed, you know, um, parents hand over fist who are all trying to enrol in the in the the council um, nurseries because obviously they can get full time uh, free. What that's meaning is it's impacting on the viability of other partner nurseries. Certainly, uh, 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 so how are we actually if that if councils are going to be doing that? How does that help workforce planning when we're trying to get? possibly uh, somewhere between 12 and 20,000 additional staff uh, in within the next three years. I don't think that, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a particular, a particular example. I think, um, yeah, if we want to get an argument about um, where the best type of childcare is, there's plenty of international studies which says public service delivery for child education, childcare is the gold standard and it's where we ought to be going. Rather, well, at the moment, we need both um, because, I mean, there are funding issues and other reasons that, you know, that to, to do that. So when we have both, and that's certainly true in childcare, it's certainly true in social care, my view is the workforce plan needs to encompass uh, right we talk about public service workforce planning not public sector workforce planning but obviously that is a challenge you know the, when you've got 14,000 care providers a lot of them very small their capacity to engage in that sort of dialogue but you know in fairness to them I would say we're not having that in social care there's a bit of that around the IJBs when you've got some of the providers around the table uh, I think probably not in the child care sector and I think there's a case for essentially a sector
sectoral uh, bargaining approach, which is recommended by the Fair Work Convention, which would be a public service one, and that would get at least some of these organisations round the table so they could make the points they're obviously making to you, uh, and that could be built in, into, into workforce planning. We're not simply saying, well, exclude everybody other than the public sector. We represent you know, private and voluntary sector care providers as well, uh, and our view is that you have to bring all of these round the table and have a public service solution, as in fact, again, the Christie Commission recommended over five years ago. Okay, anyone else get any points you want to make on that particular question? No, no. Okay. I know, I know, I know. Can I just ask a question of, of Rebecca, if, if I may convene? I mean, in, in your submission, you've suggested uh, looking at things. Well, first of all, I would say a lot. Of what, what you know, all this talk about why do people not declare? Well, maybe people don't want to be defined according to their ethnicity. And I'm saying that as someone who is of uh, Scottish, Irish, Scandinavian, Jewish, East European, and South Indian ancestry. So many people are, are, are a mixture, and maybe don't think they should be defined within one particular box or another. But what you have said. And your response is that there should be, you should set public BME employment targets to which organisations are held to account. So I'm just wondering how that would be done uh, practically, given the fact that you know the, the the proportion of BME people across Scotland varies enormously. So would the quota, if you want to call it that, be set according to uh, the population within a local authority? Would it be set? Uh, within a department, within a council, for example, uh, and you know you've looked at Eastern Bartonshire, four point two percent, with four point two percent of planners, four point two percent, you know, of people who work in the museums department, with fourteen point two percent, four point two percent people in cleansing have to be BME, or would it be generally? Um, and of course, uh, Graham raised the issue of teachers, but of course, it's individual schools that recruit teachers, not local authorities per se. So how would local? How would a school? Would it, would it be the same? Would it be by the English department? Would it have to have a proportion the maths department? How how would this be delivered in in practical terms? That's a great question. I think across different jobs and in individual schools, there will be variation, which is why I guess if we're talking about targets, it would probably be a council target, a local authority target, um, maybe something that's disaggregated into some of the the bigger kind of job areas within that. But I think the place to do it, if you're wondering, is within those kind of public sector equality duty reports. Um, you know, NHS bodies do them, councils do them, education authorities do them, large and small um, non-departmental public bodies do them. Um, so they're probably the ones who are best placed to understand what their workforce looks like, what a reasonable target would be, what measures they would have to take to reach there. Um, I think those reports would represent a good place to do that. Um, but yeah, setting, you know, if it's a 4% BME uh, figure across the country, obviously that differs from, you know, Glasgow to Orkney. So, you know, one size won't fit all, but I think um, those bodies which are listed under the public sector equality duties would, you know, we would welcome and encourage any target setting in those individual and, and, and uh, just to follow that up, I mean, obviously, would, would this percentage be a, a target? Would it be a minimum? Because in some areas of the public sector, not local government, for example, medicine, you know, it's well exceeded this target. Um, so how, how, how would that be? Um, and one other, just one other thing. Um, I, I do have concerns that the, in terms of the, the, the posts advertised and interviewed, you talked about 17.7% of BME applicants were successful and 31.3% of white British Scottish, but yet 51% of other white shortlisted applicants. So the gap between white British and other white is higher at 19.7% than between white, Sco white Scottish and British and BME at 13.6%. So do you think there should be a balance overall, not just in terms of um, BME, but also white Scottish British relative to other white well, people? I'm not the individual who did that particular bit of research, but from what I understand, I think that may have been reflective of the small numbers represented in the white but not British or Scottish numbers that might have resulted in that skewing a bit because um, it was done through a freedom of information request, so it was limited by the information we were able to get and the bodies who responded to that. So I'm not, and that is just a local authority figure, so I'm not certain that would be a problem across all sort of employers, but. I'd be happy to look into that a bit more for you. Um, so just a bit about, tar about the about targets. About, should it be a target or should it be a minimum? Should it be a target or should it be a minimum? I think 
you know, I don't think legally we can set minimums and quotas. I think targets are what we're able to do at the minute. Um, I think making them public and, you know, highlighting them in these reports is a good way to increase accountability. And also we were talking a bit about problems with um, BME groups maybe not wanting to go into local authority jobs. I think, you know, that's a bit to do with visibility. That's a lot to do with career advice. And I think it's also somewhat to do with the equalities rhetoric that, or the lack of equalities rhetoric that might be surrounding some public bodies. So I think the more we can emphasize that there is a desire to reach parity, the better it'll be, whether that is through groups setting their own targets or groups setting their own minimums, um, as long as it is done in a, a public way that involves the communities themselves, I think that's yeah. positive. Has, has that answered your question? Sorry. I think so, yeah. Can I just ask one of the of, of, uh, of, of Sarah and Sharon then? Just uh, You can do it and then just give people a time check because yeah. uh, kind of using our deliberation time, it's just I feel as if for after the session to, to allow <coughs> MSPs to ask some more questions. So we'll, we'll be finished in around 10 minutes time or so. Alexander Stewart's got a final question we'd like to ask and that will wrap uh, up the session. Thanks, convener. It's, just, it's about an issue that uh, Dave Watson's talked a lot about but I'm quite interested in hearing Sarah and Sharon's perspective and that's about how we actually bridge this gap of the 65,000 health and care workers by 2022 that we need. Now, we know there's already a chronic shortage. We know that there's high turnover. And I'm just wondering, Sarah, how, can we, how do we attract young people? I mean, I've actually participated in some kind of a Prince's Trust kind of... Um, uh, uh, co uh, um, courses where, where they, they've, they've worked to look specifically at people on the edges of the employment market to try and get them in, and they've actually been very successful. I just wonder how we how we kind of scale it. How do we get younger people interested in this crucial area of the public sector and, uh, and um, workforce planning? And I think that's an area through the, the network that we're looking at in terms of increasing employer presence in schools and how we can actually attract them from quite an early age. Um, so then there was an example, I think, recently with Fife Council who had been doing some foundation apprenticeships um, and had been working very closely with employers and that one individual, I think, that was in the news had secured a role. So I think it's about getting in earlier. Um, and looking at how we do that and we increase our presence and build our relationships. So maybe taking people from school to visit care homes to actually see what it's like on the uh, in the front line, that kind of thing? Yeah, well. I mean, there's ways that, that actually in North Lanarkshire we are doing that through our supported employment where we are offering that off the back of, of placements, but yeah, definitely, and bringing people into schools and looking at what we can do within the health and safety. Um, and what about yourself, Sean? Particularly the gender imbalance. I mean, obviously, there's a you know, as 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 Dave said earlier, just isn't the, the the women in the workforce available, and Brexit's going to reduce that significantly. So, what can we do to get more males, for example, interested in the care sector? I think one of the areas as well, it's about talking about the career pathway with um, people, because just now, um, well, I'm saying just now, historically, I don't think we've been very bad, but good at signposting the pathway for people and the possibilities that it could open up. And that's something that local authorities are working on to actually show that there can be a career in health and social care and how that, you know, we could look for somebody. So it's, it's attractive for people coming out of school, but also attractive for people retraining. They see, you know, the opportunities. And also the, um, for some people who are maybe retraining, it's maybe someone who's taking a redundancy at some point in life and is looking to retrain in another area. It's about the flexibility you can get in that role as well, because it's not a typically a nine to five role. So sometimes that works for people as well who maybe want to have a, a different approach to life. So that's the things that we need to make um, people aware of and make it more attractive to people for the career and the flexibility and give to your lifestyle as well. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Kavira. Okay, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Kavira. We, we've touched on so many points this morning. It's really been very informative and very interesting. But we touched on managing decline. We touched on the pressures that the, that the councils are facing. We know that you're being asked to do more with less. Uh, but what are the pressures that the Scottish Government and their prioritising from here, from this Parliament, when they talk about ensuring that affordable housing becomes the priority uh, or, or the, 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 the care sector becomes the priority? We've also discussed earlier with, with uh, General Garus about the, the involvement in, in the, the child sector uh, and also empowering communities. So you, you are being given that added pressure and you're being given that added uh, intensity for you to deliver on what is expected from the Scottish Government, but you're not necessarily being given the resource and the finances and funds to make that happen. Uh, and how, how that impacts on workforce planning would be very useful to hear from you all. 
can start. I think Sh- Sharon, that, 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 you make the mistake of making eye contact first. You it's see all, it's okay. It is. Do you know, I think if we had the answer to that, we would, you know, we'd be set up in consultancy, Dave was saying that earlier, we wouldn't be working. Do you know, I think if we had the answer to that, um, you know, we would just give you a bit of paper and go, right, like, there's the way to sort it. What you've outlined there is very real. So that is day to day what it is like working a council, right? There's a huge number of priorities when you look at every one of them is the right thing to do. Um, there is a lot happening with community empowerment. That does take a different skill set as well. Um, a lot of councils are looking at how we train employees more to engage with the workforce, uh, sorry, the communities better. Um, how we, you know, we, we look at it from their point of view. So we're not just doing a policy because that's the way we do it. Um, it's more about what the community needs and how the customer, if I use the example, even job names. So health and social care integration, it doesn't help one of our residents if someone goes in from the local authority that's called a support worker and then the NHS person comes in and they're called a a care worker, it just can confuse people, especially if they've got dementia or something. So we, we need to be better at working on things and thinking from the customer perspective. I think how we deal with that is we try to, um, you know, we set out, look at the priorities and try and balance our resource best we can. I think where the challenges come with us is it's fine with the big priority items. What it sits behind that is all the statutory requirements, audit requirements. As a local authority and an employer, we want to be rushing as best practice for a lot of things. Um, there is the challenges of equality. There's all these different aspects that we're trying to deliver on. I think the difficulty then is you can't be gold standard for everything. And that's where local authorities, I feel, are at this point in time. They are trying to deliver right what can be gold standard and what maybe needs to drop to silver or bronze. And that's difficult. Some of these decisions are very difficult and it can be difficult messages to, to ha have them talk. But I think, um, how can you help? I think it's just about, we, we all need to have try and have the best agreed approach to have the best outcome for our residents. And that can be difficult because there's always different views. Any other comments on that, Dave Watson? I, I, I mean, let me. I, I think the Scottish Government is perfectly entitled to set uh, broad priorities, and, and largely we would agree they're the right ones, like childcare, like um, because we know what a difference education and childcare at the early stage, not just child mind, but uh, education interventions uh, at before birth and shortly afterwards has on the inequality. It's massive, uh, and therefore I think that's the right priority. Um, we, we, the priority to put money into social care is right because the demographics are undeniable and the cost of having people you know, uh, delayed discharges in, in our NHS hospitals is enormous and clearly crazy. When we did a Christie Commission, there were two chunks of money that we, we looked at. One was prisons and the other was acute hospitals where you could actually free up resources if you did things differently. Politically, hugely difficult to do for you lot. Uh, entirely closing hospitals and, and prisons is, is, not, is not an easy political sell on the doorstep. I accept that. But nonetheless, from a public policy point of view, I'd have to tell you that's where, that's where the money is. So we agree with the priorities. Obviously, we'd argue the funding hasn't always followed those priorities. We made the argument this year in local government you needed 2.5% for those priorities just to stand still before we talked about the 3% for inflation when we actually we ended up getting 1.5% for inflation. So those are the sorts of funding arrangements there. I think there's, um, there's the, the, the point that was being made earlier about, about leadership's important there. These are different skills. Uh, if I sound irritated by, I'm not picking on Q, Queen Market University, but frankly, you know, closing down essentially the sort of courses where the next generation of leaders are going to come from is very irritating when we need to move to a more collaborative model to pick up the points that Sharon was making around community. These are different skills. This is not about command and control. This is about getting people to work together in different ways. That requires very different leadership skills. And my last point would be uh, preventative spending. Uh, everyone agrees, your committee, every committee in the Parliament says preventative spending is the way forward. Let me tell you that in local government, every single survey we have done of staff, they say the one thing they're abandoning is preventative work. If you ask, if you ask environmental health officers, they don't do education in, in the kitchens anymore. Talk about training standards officers, they don't sit in the fact you're talking about the way you can, you can make those changes. It's that type of work which is easy. And what happens is you just do the enforcement, you just do the statutory basics, and you abandon that. So we're serious about preventive spending. We need to build in some resource to do that as well. As you identified, 
by, by losing the resource, by losing the staff numbers. Uh, you're then judged by the, the care commissioner or Scotland on how you perform as a local authority, and you're then judged uh, across the, the, the benchmarking review to see which one is the best uh, and how they manage that process. Uh, and that makes it even more difficult for you to try and square that circle to ensure that you are providing the services that people require at the time they need them. Yeah, you just tick boxes, to be, to be blunt. Uh, the building control that you, your committee looked at, yeah, we made the point on our survey, building control officers said they spend two days a week filling in the Scottish Government forms you know, for a whole monitoring arrangement, which was frankly over the top. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, government and others need to look at, and, it, and the regulations and issue in social care, et cetera, you know, about just looking, focusing on what we need to do to free up staff to go out there and do the job they were paid to do. Thank you. Kevin. Okay. Um, we have had a good shift, I think, uh, this morning. Uh, I should say, just before I, I, I do the kind of formal thanks, that this was a budget scrutiny uh, evidence session. I think we understandably meandered under the theme of, of, of workforce planning, but just to remind witnesses, uh, is it about budget scrutiny? Yes, as I said during my line of questioning, there will be debate around the level, the input into the local government settlement when the, when the budget appears later this year and the, pro the final part of the process early next year, that, that will happen with the political domain. It always does. We have to do our best to get, get beneath those numbers, not just whether those numbers are sufficient, but how the money is used at a local level. And we want to do that in relation to workforce planning. That is not an easy task because uh, otherwise we're only measuring inputs. If we only go to that raw data, we want to measure outcomes at a local authority level. So we're lurching a, a little bit around in the dark. So if you, you, you go back home and you go, actually, here's a really good thing that could be tracked and looked at in terms of outcomes at a local authority level, please give us that information. That would be very, very helpful. Be very helpful to get information of where, uh, you know, a substantial input perhaps gives a poor outcome or a reduced input gives a, a better outcome so we can get to track where that money's been best used within the public sector, but that's without shirking the obvious challenges there's going to be financially at a local authority level. So that's my appeal to the witnesses. Thank you for what is approaching two hours of evidence, which I think is above and beyond the call of duty for all four of you. <laughs> uh, so that said, we are now finished this evidence session and we move into private session uh, at agenda item two. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>